may I say hello and welcome, and I'm delighted that so many have turned up, and I hope there may be a few more joining us. Um, we're delighted that Steve is going to give us his talk on flight and all that, and that is, that is very exciting. Could I just say a bit of housekeeping that Sarah will be managing the screen. She will um, um, cut off our microphones during the talk, but unmute people who need to talk. And if you like during the talk to, if you have ideas that you want to ask about, you can just write them down under the chat button. But if that isn't what you want to do, then you can just at the end under the Q and A, um, raise a hand and, and, and uh, we'll pick it up in that way. Now, if I may, I'll hand over to Douglas who will kindly introduce Steve, who I think he's known for some considerable time. So Douglas, over to you. And can I just say to everybody, we are recording this and therefore it'll be up on YouTube in due course and you can relive the experience. So thank you and over to you, Douglas. Thank you. So uh, my name is Douglas Russell. I'm one of the committee members of the British Ornithologist Club. Um, and I have been fortunate to know Steve for the last 13 or so years, having first met him when we were involved in research on eggshell colour with Dr. Phil Cassie and Dr. Gollum Mora at the University of Birmingham in the summer of 2008, which seems a thousand years ago now. That project, largely using biochemical analysis of eggshell pigmentation, made considerable progress in determining the specific role of different compounds and their relationships with measurable components of colour, ultimately helping to deconstruct colour traits into their component biochemical, physical and physiological parts and illuminating the proximate mechanisms and ultimate consequences of interspecific variation in eggshell colour among bird species. Since then, Steve continued his research in a diverse range of related and unrelated areas of ornithology, including feeding ecology, metabolism, migration, and flight. Since his time in Birmingham, Steve has gone on to be a reader at Royal Holloway and has continued his enthusiastically diverse research. Few ornithologists I have ever met have the level of passionate enthusiasm for any and all areas of ornithology. If there is an area of ornithology Steve is not interested in, I'm yet to find it. Recently, Steve has revisited his research, his research on avian eggshell, and I'm glad to say that we are again collaborating in his lab's research on the evolution of eggshell surface topography. Evolution has adapted avian eggshell to all the terrestrial habitats on Earth. Understanding the ecological conditions under which certain eggshell structures and properties are most advantageous is key to explaining the enormous variation that exists in eggshell across all birds. And I'm proud that the collection Phil, Steve and I developed is key to this ongoing research. However, tonight's talk is not on the subject of eggs. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Steve as a member of the British Ornithologist Club Committee, as a scientific associate of the Bird Group at the Natural History Museum, and as my friend. So over to Steve to discover a little more about how birds cooperate and the mechanisms they employ to save energy during flight. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Douglas. That was a really nice introduction. And also, my brain is just a little bit overloaded there with how time has flown. Um, <laughs> I'm also feeling quite, quite old right now, but in a very positive way. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you very much, Douglas. And, and thank you um, for inviting me um, to give this talk this evening. And um, as Douglas alluded to, my, my interests and my research interests are somewhat diverse. Um, it's basically a a poor attention span almost that leads me to want to study so many different things but a, a running theme throughout the last decade or so along with my egg research has been looking at um, birds and looking at bird flight in particular and flocking and my interests in research are all about what happens when animals come together in a group and basically how do they make decisions so for example this might just be a short flight across a lake it might be a 25,000 kilometer migration. But either way, at some stage, if you're in a group, either an individual or a, a portion of that group or a collective have made the decision to move. And somehow you've convinced the rest of that group to come with you. And I'm interested in what happens when animals come together in these groups. 
Who decides where to go, when to go? Is it something special about their physiology? Is it something special about their personality? Who's benefiting from being in that group? And who's having a bit of a rough time and a tough time um, from being in that collective? And we know that animals come together in groups for a multitude of reasons, um, all of which are sort of being slightly overstimulated by, um, by all the videos currently running on screen. But we know, for example, that when you see giant fish bait balls or where you see huge quantities of bats coming out of a roost site, they are trying to use their sheer numbers as a dilution effect against predators. So rather selfishly, the idea is well, there's 10,000 of us. If one of us gets eaten, there's a high chance it's not going to be me. So when we look at these groups, we think we get this warm, fuzzy feeling, but actually they're almost parasitizing off each other and they're hoping that it's your mate Bob or Sarah that gets eaten, not you, Sarah, sorry, a uh, <laughs> generic bat, Sarah, um, that gets eaten during a predation event um, and it's not you. By having large numbers in a group, like we can see with these fish and these sharks, you can also create a confusion effect where the predators really struggle to single out an individual. You can also use being in a group for a collective defense. And if ever you've accidentally walked close to a gull colony or a tern colony, you realize how effective that collective defense actually is. Um, I accidentally stumbled close to an Arctic tern colony uh, many years ago on the Shetland Islands. And by the time I walked away, there was an appropriate amount of blood pouring down my head where many little beaks had been busy jabbing away um, and it was very effective. Animals also huddle together for warmth like these emperor penguins and also like these widgeons are doing as they move further away from the safety of their water body. They increase their vigilance but by working as a group you can actually reduce individual vigilance while group vigilance as a whole increases. So we know there's loads of benefits, basically, to living in a group. My interests in particular are what happens when birds come together in a group and then get on the move. So when they're traveling together as a flock. And we know that when birds come together in a flock, they form two types of distinct flock shape or flock structure, if you like. And that's either a cluster flock, it's always a bit tricky to say, or a V formation flock. And interestingly, what seems to determine what flock shape and structure that birds fly in is all down to their size. And that cutoff seems to be somewhere around the size of a black headed gull or a golden plover. So if you're bigger than that, you tend to fly in a V formation. And if you are smaller than that, you tend to fly in a cluster formation. And we're going to start by looking at V formation. And what you're looking at here um, is some lovely uh, footage of cranes flying over Venice and some barnacle geese flying up the northern coast of France. Now, for anybody sort of uh, expert in birds, you will realize that particularly in the summer, barnacle geese are not typically flying up the north coast of France. These are actually someone's pet um, that they've trained to fly with them, whereas the cranes are undergoing a natural migration. But something that these species have in common is a complete lack of manoeuvrability. They can fly super fast. If you look at geese and swans and ducks, their flight speeds are very impressive. But their manoeuvrability is poor. The turning circle of a crane is almost that of a jumbo jet. They're not built for manoeuvrability. They're built for capturing uh, hot thermal currents and for good, predictable, fast forward flight. So it seems that there's a link between size and maneuverability, and that dictates whether you fly in a V formation or not. But people have posited sort of a number of ideas about why animals, uh, birds in particular, may be flying in a V formation. One of the ideas is that it's a way of keeping a visual contact with the individual at the front. So if you're trying to follow a leader, and there's loads of individuals blocking and occluding your view, then you're going to struggle to follow that leader and maintain a constant path. It's also been suggested that it's a way of, uh, similar to the visual contact, of sharing navigation. That individual at the front might have much, much more experience than you, and you want to keep an eye on them because they know where they're going, and frankly, you're not so sure. 
Similarly, as I've mentioned, there's this predation idea that basically you go in a group, you're in a V, and you hope that if someone's going to get taken out by a peregrine vulcan or a bat hawk or an eagle, maybe it's the one at the back and that's not you. But lastly, there's this idea that's persisted for centuries, that is that there's an energetic benefit to flying in a V formation. And this idea has attracted the imagination of people, as I say, for a very long time. And in fact, you can go way, way back to um, AD 23 with Pliny, always a Pliny quote for everything as the quote goes. Um, but he wrote that like fast galleys cleaving uh, more easily through the air, you know, he already had this idea that basically there was a benefit, an energetic benefit um, to flying in a V formation. And this was at a time when most of Europe, for example, thought that, for example, when swallows disappeared from our shores in the winter, they were hibernating in riverbeds. Or this idea that geese that disappe uh, disappeared in the spring were somehow summering in barnacles and various other things. Now, I know these were often called the Dark Ages, but when you look at the size of a barnacle and you look at the size of a goose, one does wonder how they came up with that. But nevertheless, some intelligent folk back in those days were looking up at the sky, they were seeing birds flying in a V formation, and they were suggesting there was a benefit, an aerodynamic benefit to flying in that formation. And the reason that that formation uh, has been suggested to be beneficial is all to do with what you're looking at here. So what you can see are a series of photographs which show what happens to air as a plane moves through it. So when an aeroplane or indeed a bird or indeed a human, if you threw them fast enough out of a catapult, as you move th forward through the air, you actually have to push the air out of the way to make room for you. It stands to reason you're an object, you're traveling through a fluid, and as you do so, you're pushing the air out the way. Now, when you do that, most of this air gets pushed downwards under the body of the plane or the bat or the catapulting human. A tiny amount of this air gets pushed out along the wing and it trails off the wingtip. And what you can see in these pictures are what we call these wingtip vortices, this air that is being pushed and channeling off the wingtips of the plane. Now, how big the object is that's moving through the air will determine how much air they move out the way. Now that is why if you go and sit at Heathrow and you have a giant Airbus come in, there will be a longer gap till the next plane comes in than if it was a small jet, because the big plane has caused more air to move and you have to wait longer for it to settle and dissipate. Now, for an animal that's moving in the air, that vortices that you can see coming off these wingtips is what we simplify, if you like, and we call it upwash. Now, this upwash can actually be beneficial. The rest of the air that is being pushed under the object, we call downwash. And this is not beneficial to be behind. It's akin to someone pushing your head down as you're trying to surface in a swimming pool, for example. Now, if you're struggling to imagine what this might look like, NASA have helpfully made this video and they flew a passenger plane without the passengers, one should stress, through these smoke plumes. And you can see these vortices that are created. And now you have to imagine that that's happening continuously as an object moves through the air. So once we have started to understand a bit more about flight and how it worked, for decades, physicists, mathematicians, engineers became quite obsessed with applying some really complicated maths far beyond my capacity to try and predict where birds should fly, where they should position themselves in this V formation, if indeed they are trying to take advantage of this upwash. So what this diagram is showing you, you have two geese that are sort of uh, apart. And remember, in its simplest form, that air coming off the wingtip is good air. 
it's upwash. The air coming off the back of the bird is bad, it's downwash. And these complicated sums and all these various other fancy stuff they did try to predict where should a bird position itself to capture the upwash. How far back should it be? How far out should it be? But the one problem that these physicists and mathematicians and the various other folk did is they applied what we call fixed wing aerodynamics to birds. So put simply, they forgot the whole flapping thing and just treated a bird like an aeroplane with a static solid wing. Now, of course, many birds are flapping their wings seven, eight times a second. And that doesn't include hummingbirds, which of course are off the chart in a whole world of their own. So much of what we were trying to understand failed because we treated birds as aeroplanes. So there was a big gap in our knowledge and this gap persisted well into sort of the 2010s. This isn't something that was solved until relatively recently. So if you're a bit of a visual learner, put in its most sort of straightforward form. Here you have this upwash in red coming off the wingtip of a bird and another bird can pop itself in that upwash, in that red area on this video, get a bit of lift, get some help, have an easier time by positioning yourselves in the upwash and by flying in a V, you simultaneously avoid the downwash. Now, before we sort of start to talk a bit about the work I did, a fair enough question would be, why do we care uh, how birds fly in a V formation? Why would anyone spend time and money trying to work these things out? And much of that is because we are looking to steal from them, essentially. We call it biomimetics because it sounds nicer, but really it's stealing from nature or being inspired by nature, should I say. It's looking at how millions of years worth of evolution have solved a problem and going, thank you, we'll have that. And part of the V formation flight has been wanting to apply it um, to aeroplanes and to try and understand how we could potentially save money and save fuel by getting planes to fly in a V formation. Now, when you look at planes currently flying in a V formation, whether that be recently or in the war, for example, they were not flying in a V for energetic benefits. They were flying in a V formation because the person at front and the front was in charge. And also if you're firing guns, for example, from your plane, flying in a line in front of each other isn't a very good way of going about it. You need to space each other out, otherwise only one of you is gonna be left at the end. So we don't have the technology at this point to, to understand how to fly close enough to each other in planes to benefit from this upwash. But it is a real goal of a number of large aero, uh, aerospace companies who want to have planes flying in V formation. So this is a video one of the big companies has made recently, which tells you what they want to do in the future. Their goal is that you have a series of planes taking off from a number of hubs in a country. In this instance, it's leaving Australia. They would meet up off the east coast of Australia a plane from Sydney, a plane from Melbourne, a train from, uh, plane from Cairns. They would fly in a V formation over the Pacific Ocean, saving fuel, thus saving money, thus better for the environment, though that's not their driving uh, thing, to be honest, but it would save and be better for the environment. And then when they hit the west coast of the States, they would start to peel off to their respective destinations, whether that's New York, Chicago, Seattle, wherever that may be. So there was a real application for this and, and, a, and a desire for it to understand, um, to apply it, um, to solve some real world issues. But the problem with this is it's really hard to study. How do you find out that information from birds flying a kilometre up in the sky, maybe flying 75 miles per hour? How do you begin to understand what is taking place between those individuals? What interactions are going on between them? How are they positioning themselves? How far out are they going? Who's in charge? Now, these things weren't possible to answer until the invention of what we call biologging. And biologging has been one of those fields where the speed of advancement has been incredible. So 20 years ago, they were the size of a car battery and you could put them on whale sharks and elephants and that was about it. 
20 years later, we have this amazing technology that weighs maybe eight to 10 grams. And they can tell us so much about what an animal is doing. They can, for example, measure pressure so we know how deep a bird or a turtle is diving. We can know how high they were flying. We have high resolution GPS so we know exactly where that bird was. We also have these amazing devices called accelerometers. And what these do is at 300 times a second, they measure the movements of the bird or the animal, the body movements of what that animal is doing. So basically through using a biologging approach, we can spy on birds when we can't see them or we don't want to worry them or off put them by being around them. We can deploy these little biologgers and we can spy on them. What this meant is that you could put these biologgers on birds flying in V formation and you could see where each bird would, is, where it's positioned, where it's flying. And with the accelerometers, you can identify every single wing beat that that bird takes in a flight or indeed its entire life. So you can start to recreate V formation flight. But there was one problem with this. At the moment, these loggers, you have to get them back to get the data off. So if I went down to the local park and I caught some Canada geese under license and I put my loggers on them and I waved them off into the distance, I probably wouldn't see those loggers again. And these cost thousands and thousands of pounds. So if you're deploying, uh, deploying a combination of loggers on a flock of 20 birds, you're looking at maybe 30, 40,000 pounds. So you kind of want to make sure you're going to get the loggers back. Otherwise your funders and your department aren't very pleased with you um, as you sort of wave off these loggers into the distance. So we had the technology, but we needed birds that we could put loggers on, let them go off and do their thing, but critically get the loggers back at the end. And that's where this species um, entered the arena, as it were. And this is a northern bald ibis. And you're looking at possibly one of the best photos ever taken of a northern bald ibis. Wonderful lighting, skin looks good. But the sad thing about this photo is that it was taken as part of a National Geographic campaign, which highlighted the 10 species in the world who are at most risk of going extinct in the near future. And that's because northern bald ibis have disappeared from 99% of their former range. They used to be found throughout Europe, throughout the Middle East, and throughout Central and Northern Africa. And now there is one population left in Morocco. Unfortunately, there used to be another population in Syria, but that was uh, shot and they were killed um, in around 2015-16 um, during the ongoing conflict that's taking place in that country. Now that was important because they were the only migratory ibis left. The population that lives in Morocco is unusual, but they live all year round. So there's this fantastic conservation group and they are called the Waldrop team and that's because in German the northern bald ibis are called Waldrop. And they are working really hard to reintroduce the species into its former range. So they are taking captive ibis from zoos, they are hand rearing them, and they are trying to reintroduce them as migratory birds back into Europe. And they do that through a process of imprinting. So what that means is they take parents who are in a zoo, because there's no wild migratory birds left, the second the eggs hatch, the first thing they see are human foster parents. And those human foster parents then live with those chicks 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the first nine months of their life. So as far as the ibis are concerned, they, these human foster parents are their real parents. There's no distinction for the ibis. And you can see just how imprinted and ingrained the ibis are with the human foster parents. And these human foster parents do an amazing job. Um, you can imagine what they smell like by the end of that period, you're living with birds 24 seven, um, but they imprint them. And the reason this is super critical 
is that you have to teach them how to migrate because there are no adult birds. So, interesting noise there. Don't know what that was. Um, is that you have to teach them how to migrate and where to migrate to. And you do that by when they are a certain age, you get the human foster parents, you put them in a microlight and you get them up in the sky. And because these iris are imprinted on the human foster parents, they instantly follow the parent and fly with the microlight. Now, of course, they're not just learning how to sort of fly in a V formation, they're just learning to fly full stop. They've not been flying much. And you put this foster, uh, foster parent up in a microlight, you give them a megaphone, and they basically call constantly to the young birds to encourage them. Now, because wool drops short into Wally in German, it's quite entertaining that they fly over this village to shouting Wally at the birds um, through this megaphone. But you can see that it works really well. And once the birds are trained and they're in good physical condition, you can start your migration. And the migration route that these birds took was from where they were reared in Salzburg, around the Alps, because the microlite can't cope with the conditions, and down into Italy and onwards into southern Italy. And this is done over a period of weeks to mimic what would be the conditions normally for these birds to migrate in. And this is a huge operation. There are hundreds of people involved. There are people setting up the, camp, uh, the camps in advance where you're flying to. There's the pilots and the foster parents. There's the people that feed them. There's the people that clean them out. Um, it's a huge operation. And they fly them down to southern Italy. And what that presented for us was an opportunity to deploy our loggers on actual birds who are actually migrating up in the sky without people, because actually they fly off to the side of the microlite. So if they get too close, of course, it could go wrong. And suddenly we had this opportunity where these birds come back at the end of the day after a long flight. And the first thing they want to do is have a hug with mum and dad. They literally run up to the foster parents and you have a big sort of uh, reaffirming ceremony of, of you know, wasn't, didn't I do well, mum, aren't I great? And whilst they're having this hug, you can take your loggers off and suddenly you've got your data. So what did we actually find? Well, what we found at first was actually quite annoying because despite everything I'd said about um, the previous work, treating birds as planes, it turns out when we did all the maths, where the birds position themselves perfectly matched fixed wing aerodynamic theory. And why that's the case, I'll explain in a couple of slides time. But what this heat plot is showing you, the more red the area is, the more time birds spent in that position. And you can see that the birds like to fly about 1.4 meters out and about 1.4 meters back. And we call this their V favored position. It's where they spent most of their time. What was interesting was how dynamic the flights were. So what you're looking at here looks a little bit like a Hawaiian atoll or something, but up the top left there, that's a heat plot of the whole flight. And it shows you where birds spent most of their time. So it's more like a boomerang actually, rather than a V. What these plots on the right are showing you, the gray shaded area behind it is actually this overall uh, flock shape. And then each single little diagram is one individual bird. And it shows you how much they actually moved around when they were in this V formation. And we had some who were a bit left-handed as it were, left wing, they prefer to be on the left side. We had individuals who spent a lot of time at the front, and of course, there's always some individuals who just went around everywhere and getting in everyone's way. And the reason they moved around so much will become clear um, shortly. What became also really interesting out of this was how the birds have a social network. So for example, during a training flight one day, there was a bird called Merlin and Merlin literally just dropped out of the sky, clearly had hit an exhaustion point and was like, I'm done. I'm going down, I'm going to go and sit on a tree. 
And being in the micro light, you could actually see the other birds turn around, look at him, clock who it was. Oh, it's Merlin. Merlin's tired, going off. And they didn't care at all. They just carried on. There was no response from the other birds that one of them was tired and had to stop. Now, interestingly, a few days later, the same thing happened with a bird called Archimedes. And when Archimedes said, people are knackered, I need to go and sit down on the tree. The other birds all looked around and went, oh, it's Archimedes. We like Archimedes. And all went down with him to sit while he rested and then took off with him when he was ready. And then when we started to look at the dynamics on the ground, we found that Archimedes basically had lots of friends and none of the birds liked Merlin. It was rather sad, really. He didn't really have any friends. None of the others would sit with him. They wouldn't preen him. Um, whereas Archimedes was very high in the social network, lots of friends, lots of preening. And therefore, when he got tired, the others stopped with him. So how is it then that birds who flap their wings seven times a second are matching fixed wing aerodynamic theory? And why are they moving around so much? It's, it's very strange. You would think, well, surely that's a waste of energy. And what we found was very unexpected and quite complex. So I'm going to keep this bit just to two slides. But what they were doing is they were creating a pathway of least resistance through the air for the birds that were following them in their V favored position. So what on earth do I mean by that? So to give you an analogy, think back to when you were a kid and imagine there had been an amazingly heavy snowfall. And actually when you're four or five, you know, four feet of snow is quite hard work to walk through. Now imagine that your mum or your dad had gone out before you and stepped through the snow, flattening it down, creating a path for you to follow. And if you then follow that by putting your feet in the same footprints your parents have left behind for you, you don't have to work as hard. Your life is much easier. You can follow that path of helpfulness that your parents have created for you in the snow. So you're not doing the same thing at the same time because you're following them, but you're doing the same thing in the same place. Now, when a bird is flapping and moving forward, this upwash, this good air, it follows the same path through the air as the wingtip, which makes sense, it's coming off the wingtip. So when you think about a bird flapping, it's going up and down, up and down, up and down like this, through the air, that wingtip will be taking a path doing this as the bird flaps up and down. Now this upwash, this good air, is also doing the same thing. It's coming off the wingtip and it's taking this pathway through the air. Now, as the bird in front, for example, flies forward, it's leaving this trail of upwash behind it in the air. Now, amazingly, what the birds behind it are doing is making sure that their wingtip follows that pathway of upwash through the air. So they are actively tracking that path of goodness that the bird in front has left behind. Now imagine, for example, I said to one of you, here's a spray can that you don't go and graffiti, but here's a spray can. Spray it, run like a nutter into the distance, flapping your wings like a bird. And if you looked behind you, there would be a pattern of red doing this. Now I would say to the next person, you need to run at the same speed and put your little finger in that trail of paint, that trail of red that's been left behind. It's an amazingly hard thing to do, and we don't know how they do it. But it means that they're not just sat there roughly thinking, oh, I might pick up some upwash every now and again. They are actively tracking the upwash in the air that's been left by the bird in front by making sure that their wingtip follows the same pathway through the air. And we call that spatial phasing and wingtip path coherence, which are rather fancy terms. But what it means is that you do the same thing with your wing in the same place as the bird in front. And that ensures that you're capturing the upwash as best you possibly can. Now this slightly cartoon-esque video helps a little bit. 
There's the bird flying and flapping, and the yellow is the upwash coming off its wings. And if that bird positions itself back there, that's the pathway and the pattern of flapping it needs to take through the air to make sure that its wingtip stays in the pathway of upwash. Now, what you can see there at the end of the video, if the bird moves position, suddenly it's in a different part of the upwash and it has to adjust its flapping accordingly. And indeed, that's what we saw time and time again. So if they get a bit closer to each other, they have to change their rhythm to make sure that that wingtip is still in the upwash. So it's a super complicated process. It's not passive. They are actively tracking that beneficial up, uh, upwash through the air um, to make the most of it. Now, interestingly, I mentioned the social networks and don't worry too much about the graphs, but what they're telling you is that the birds remember who have done their fair share of work at the front of the flock and who's been lazy and hiding at the back, trying to have the easy time all the time. So what we found over successive days was a bird who was willing to be at the front where there's no benefit. The next day, the other birds would let that bird sit at the back and take benefit of the upwash. If you were a bit lazy for a few days and you were not taking your turn at the front, the other birds would intentionally make life difficult for you and make it hard for you to follow the upwash through the air. So they are clearly remembering who is doing whose fair share of work and they almost punish those individuals that don't play fair and don't play the game. Now, one thing we weren't sure about with these ibis is no one knows how birds learn to fly in formation. Is it that the parents are there shouting at you going, no, not there, not there, not there, get out of the way, too close or whatever. We didn't know how they did it. Interestingly, what you're looking at is, first of all, in the top left is some prior work, which showed that over time, young ibis learn how to fly in a V formation. They spend more time as they get older flying in formation. But we didn't know how they learned this. What you're seeing here with these heat plots in panels B, C and D, B is one of the very first flights the IBIS ever took. So they were learning how to fly. And you can see that it's a largely incoherent blob. There's no structure there. They were basically nearly always flying into each other, having to rest every few minutes. A few days later, panel C there, same problem. They don't really know what they're doing. And then suddenly on days eight to nine, and they start flying around more through free choice, you start to see here in panel D, the hint and development of a V. So it seems like they self teach themselves over time how to fly in a V formation. And we think that's simply through positive feedback, basically. So you're flying around, you go, that felt good, that felt easy, so I should be here. So they seem to be able to self teach themselves. They don't actually need adult birds to learn how to fly um, in a V formation. So how close are we to actually mimicking this? We are still a long way off. This is Mythbusters. And after a lot of paperwork and heavy insurance, they were trying to mimic how to fly in a V formation. So these planes are trying to fly straight and flat but they are actually flying close enough to be in the upwash of the bird in front or the plane in front, sorry. And what you can see there, not quite there yet. I certainly wouldn't be getting on that plane. If you watch what's happening, they hit the wrong bit and they go flying up. And that's because as more and more of this work is done, it seems like humans don't have the ability or capacity to be good enough to track the upwash or to maneuver correctly. And as more research is coming out, it's apparent that computers can do this. So it's likely in the future that it will be autopilot and computing which tracks the upwash and correctly puts the plane in the right position, not a human pilot, which obviously for us now is something quite hard to comprehend, uh, but possibly in 30, 40 years, it will, it will be the norm, uh, much like driverless cars. But as I say, it's, it's a way off at the moment. So that's the formation flight. There's benefit, you can get up wash from your friends. Most of you take it in turns. You remember who took their share at the front and you reward them the next day. You have complicated social networks, um, but if you work together, you can all benefit from flying in a V formation by capturing this upwash. 
For what's going on in cluster flocks, quite a different story. So what you're seeing here are two videos that went viral um, because the, the murmurations and the structures that you see when birds are flying in a cluster formation are exceptionally just amazing. You know, anything up to a million individuals acting as a single organism almost, as a single animal. Um, and these in the bottom are starlings. Rome, of course, very famous for um, starling murmurations. Somerset and Hamwall, um, Aberystwyth Pier, but there's these places you can go and witness these amazing murmurations. And indeed the one in the top video um, is these two girls that were out kayaking. And they basically, if you listen to the audio on YouTube, they thought Armageddon was happening, the sky went black and there was this cacophony of noise. Um, and then they realized that actually it was a huge flock of birds that were flying over um, in that sort of wave. Um, another great example is waders. If you go somewhere like Snettersham or somewhere and you've got sort of the knots and everything, they perform these similar feats and they really are stunning. But we haven't, well, no one has studied cluster flocking because it's incredibly hard to do. The same problems you have with the formation. And the largest birds, that fly in a cluster and thus are appropriate and ethically okay to work with with loggers are homing pigeons. And as a species, we've utilized the homing pigeon's ability to fly with quite a lot of mass on them um, for various good and not so good purposes. So what you're looking at here, for example, um, for many years, people trained homing pigeons to fly Cuban cigars from Cuba to Florida. Because um, of course, during the hostilities, you didn't couldn't get Cuban cigars. It was forbidden to have Cuban products. Um, so you had people sunbathing on a beach. A pigeon would plop down beside them, and you'd look over, and it had a cigar taped to its front. Um, fortunately, people have used them for um, transferring things like cocaine across borders in South America. And the horrible thing there is that the, the authorities are onto it and they just shoot the pigeons. And of course, these poor pigeons have had absolutely nothing to do with this. Um, they've just been uh, sort of uh, uh, accosted. And actually, during both world wars, uh, we used pigeons extensively for reconnaissance missions um, with these really um, unobtrusive cameras you can hardly see here um, in the pictures in the bottom. And indeed, Pigeons won the highest order of medals in the war um, for the number of lives that they saved. Um, Shea Ami being the best example, um, she took off with a message to alert um, Allied forces to a large squadron of soldiers who were completely surrounded and trapped. Um, she got shot through the eye, she got shot through the leg, she got shot through her flight muscle, yet somehow she carried on. Um, she delivered the message um, and the whole group was saved and she was she didn't survive but she won um, a medal um, for her bravery and, and war efforts and rightly so. But the fact that we know that pigeons can deal with these uh, extra devices attached to them, be it cocaine um, cameras or cigars, meant that we know that we could put our loggers on them securely uh, without putting them at any risk. And that's indeed what we did. And the first thing we found, and again, don't worry about the graph, that's just sort of there for someone that anyone's particularly interested in, in the science and the figures. But the take home thing for the cluster flocks, which was really surprising, was that for most of the birds in that flock, flying at a, in that flock actually comes at a cost. So it's the opposite to V formation. And we believe that that cost is because of all the tiny adjustments you have to make to avoid colliding with your flock mates. So the way I think about it is imagine I was at a, an event and I got there early, I'm at the front. And when they raise that barrier, I want to run down that field to be at the front of the, st of the stage. So I'm right at the front. And if there's no one else there, I can run as much as I like. I can zigzag, I could hop, skip and jump, no problem. If I was the 50th, 100th or 1,000th person back, I can't do that because I'm constrained by those around me. So whatever I do, I need to make sure I'm not rudely treading on strangers, tripping them over, pushing kids over, various things like that. So when you're flying in a flock and you're surrounded by birds, you have to make so many adjustments that actually you work really hard. And what this study found by Jim Usherwood and colleagues in 2011 is that the more dense a flock is, or the further back you are within that flock, 
the harder you are working. So actually there's not a benefit for you at all aerodynamically. The benefit must come from antipredation, navigation, and all these other things. This study was fascinating because it was totally unexpected. But what they did in this study though, however, was the pigeons were flying in circles above lofts. And of course, actually perpetually flying in circles, as you can see here, two trailblazer pigeons, the rest of the flock stopped being lazy shortly and joined them. Um, it's not really kind of particularly natural way of flying. Most birds don't spend hours a day flying in circles um, above somewhere. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to fly them over longer distances to see what was going on with these flock dynamics. And of course, the beauty of homing pigeons is they come home. Uh, I won't go into a big review of how they do that, but they can use smell, they can use a uh, map, they can use uh, landmarks, they can sense a magnetic field. It's believed now they can also hear infrasound. So they have a multitude of, of mechanisms available to them to make sure they find their way home. And they get better at it, the more of them there are in a group. So clearly they are somehow sharing their navigation. But I was interested to see what happened over long flights. If we know that being close to pigeons or flying at the back is costly, do they take it in turns like the ibis do? Are they nice to each other? And we did this by flying them over lots and lots and lots of flights, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of flights as a group. And you're looking here at the top right is the release site and the bottom left is where they live. And the blue trace is one of the early flights, I think roughly around flight 10. The red trace is roughly around flight 20 and the yellow trace is roughly around flight 30. And they get better over time till they solidify their route. Now, interestingly, when we first started releasing them, uh, we lost them one day, not a single pigeon came back which was rather worrying. And what we were able to then subsequently ascertain after they did return is when they were route learning, they stopped at all the country pubs. And it's not because they were alcoholic pigeons, but the big country pubs are converted, lovely buildings, big stately things, wonderful landmarks for them. So the next time we lost them, I could ring around and sure enough, they were in the pub number three, they were all in the tree um, in the pub garden because they had learned the routes via these pubs. And then once they feel more comfortable and confident, they start to take the more direct route. So were pigeons like ibis? Did they take it in turns to make sure that those poor birds at the back having a rough time weren't having a rough time all the time? And the answer was no, they don't. They are the complete opposite to the ibis. So what you're looking at here is a pigeon. Hopefully we're all familiar with the concept of pigeons. And then we have a heat plot here, which shows you the shape of the flock over a long flight. So it really is a blob. There's no sort of separating out. What you're looking at on the right, the gray shaded area is the blob again, the whole flight. And then the two heat maps are two examples of individuals of where they spent their time within a flight. And you can see that that individual at the top there was always in the front. And this individual at the bottom here was always at the back. And what that means is the one here at the front is always having an easier time. They're not having to work as hard. And this poor one at the bottom here is always having a harder time and working much harder. Now, interestingly, we released them hundreds of times and this trend persisted. The same individuals are always in the front having a wonderful time. Same individuals are always in the back having a really rough time, working super hard. At this point, we'd only ever released them as a group. I was interested to wonder if being stuck at the back of a flock maybe meant you didn't route learn very well. Your view is occluded. You're trying to concentrate on not hitting your, your flock mate and falling out of the sky. So we released them on their own for the very first time from the same release site they had been released from hundreds of times as a group. And what we found was quite surprising for an animal that's famous for its homing abilities. So on the left here in the red, these are those individuals who spent all their time at the front of the flock. And you can see that they came back a very similar route and in a similar time. 
So only about 12 to 15 minutes. They were normally home long before I got back. What you can see in the blue traces are those birds who spent most of their time at the back of the flock. As you can see, evidently, they were not paying much attention to the route learning of what was going on. Some of them took, well, the maximum uh, was seven to nine days for them to return over what is only about a 10 kilometer flight. This is despite the fact they had done that flight hundreds of times. You can see here, this individual of panel B had a pretty good effort before its logger failed um, in that evening. I should stress all the birds came back eventually, otherwise they wouldn't have their traces. Other birds didn't really bother at all. Bird F just flew in a circle for 20 minutes and then sat there for at least nine hours, at which point the logger died. Bird D, 10 out of 10 for effort, flew around for hours um, in circles. That didn't go so well. And bird G actually eventually made it back. This was very surprising. At this point, no, it was only an, uh, a sample size of one. So I had to do it all again. New release site, hundreds of releases as a group. Sure enough, same birds in the front, same birds in the back, and then release them on their own. And quite amazingly, the same thing happened. So here we have on the top left, the release site down at the bottom is the home. The red is a pigeon who's normally at the front. The black is the normal route they took. You can see that these front pigeons in the red, sure enough, came back pretty much the same route in eight to 12 minutes. Whereas those individuals at the back in the blue had absolutely no clue what was going on. In fact, even though I left it an hour between each individual release, birds H and K actually joined up momentarily for about nine minutes before realizing that it was the blind leading the blind and they ditched each other. Bird I was my favorite. Bird I flew for a about 90 seconds um, and then sat there for at least nine hours. And Bird J was very hyperactive and flew up and down one of the A roads um, local to the release site. But I found it fascinating that something that had been flying for hundreds of flights had never been paying attention. And it's likely it was some kind of passenger effect. If ever you've been a passenger in a car and then someone, the driver says to you, did we turn left or right there? You go, I'm so sorry. I wasn't paying any attention. I, I didn't know I'd be required to be called upon here. Um, couldn't even tell you where we are. I've been thinking about other things. And we actually think it's the same thing happening here. They basically are at the back. They're having a tough time anyway. They're working harder. And they simply think, I'm just gonna follow these because they know what they're doing, not going to bother. So my last couple of slides are about what makes you a front pigeon and a leader versus what makes you a back pigeon and a follower? What determines this? And it seems like it's an element of their personality, an intrinsic trait within them. So what you're looking at here is uh, the triangle is where the pigeons live. Uh, this is near my university and the square um, is my house. And in hindsight, I published this paper realizing I probably shouldn't have published my address, but never mind, you can, <laughs> can't tell the exact house. And what I did with this study is um, as soon as these baby pigeons were able to fly, I just released them um, 10 meters from the loft, 100 meters from the loft, 200 meters from the loft. And I saw um, how their ability to home varied. Now, before I released them, I did a series of experiments on them, um, behavioral experiments, where I measured their boldness how willing they were to explore a novel arena. And I measured their neophobia. How scared were they of a novel object? I then, when they were just about able to fly, left them to sit on the top of the loft and said to them, you can do what you like. You can go straight back in, or you can go and fly for nine hours and explore the local area. And what was fascinating was those individuals under laboratory conditions who wanted to explore Bear in mind, the birds are never forced to do anything. They could go and live in Windsor if they wanted. Um, those that were happy to explore, those that approached novel objects, explored them, interacted with them. When they had a free choice to explore the local area, they disappeared for hours. Those individuals who did not want to explore an arena were terrified of novel objects. When I gave them the chance to explore, they did a loop and they went straight back into their loft and largely carried on eating. Fair enough. But then what I found was when I started releasing them, 
those birds who had explored through choice were better at homing than those birds who were too scared to explore. So what you're looking at here in the red, blue and green are birds who under laboratory conditions were bold, explored novel objects and explored the local area. And when I released them, they came home pretty quick. The other here is the yellow, um, the blue, um, sorry, the brown and the black. These were individuals who in laboratories didn't want to explore, scared of novel objects, didn't want to explore the local area and their homing abilities were fairly terrible. Um, the brown one went via Thorpe Park, um, checked out the roller coaster and eventually fell asleep on the roof of the Chinese restaurant. And the yellow one, um, obviously the logger had failed by this point. Um, the yellow one hung out at the station a bit, also failed. This is only a couple of kilometers, I should stress, they had to find their way home. The black one got there eventually within nine hours. Um, but as you can see, it took somewhat of a convoluted route. Um, so it looks like, and this is just the data to back up what I've just been talking about, that a pigeon's A, homing ability, and B, whether they are leaders or followers, is linked to their personality when they're a young bird, their willingness to explore, and that, amazingly, potentially, for their whole life, will dictate whether they are flying at the front of a pigeon flock or the back, whether they are working super hard because they're stuck at the back, and maybe that they are not root learning because they're also stuck at the back. And with that, I think I've hit the hour mark. There are lots of people to thank, but I, I won't go through them all, but they're there. Um, and lastly, to thank you um, for listening. Thank you.